beautiful Saturday evening and a very good time to start looking at the issues of rebirth, recreation, renewal, redemption. Men over the years have virtually followed and tried to find reasons and experience all these issues that I've mentioned. But the book of 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 18 to 23 was talking about how some people got their redemption using the incorruptible seed, of the, which is the word of God. They did not use gold, they did not use silver. And so we are calling you today to that place of the world. So you can get to that incorruptible seed, which is the word of God that lives and abides forevermore. This is Esther 247, so thanks for joining in. And as you know, we're on the knockout series on prayer. We are hoping that by the grace of God, we are going to crush down every human thought, every philosophy. And so today we are relieving the law for recalibration. So Amen. for realignment, so we come into his will, or even the place of prayer. For some past few weeks, we've been on this prayer, and then I don't know how many, how many we still have to go yeah. to get it. But we are going to enjoy you to go to all this series to really know what we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. And so today we will continue, hoping that we will all be blessed by the end of the episode. So stay tuned. We do want to do a quick recap so that we can give them a up on where we were. Yeah, viewers over the world, thank you again for joining us on this knockout series. And specifically, we've been on knockout series on prayer. And as we always say, uh, on this particular transmission, uh, the vision that we do have is to actually expose those things that are actually making the word of God of no effect in our lives. And Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, by your traditions, you've made God's word of no effect. And we simply see that one of the things about our Christian life that is so critical is the thing of prayer. I mean, Jesus said men ought always to pray and not to faint in Luke 18. So that's the point. Now we've seen Jesus in Luke chapter 18 emphasize that what is missing in the place of prayer uh, in most cases is the issue of faith. And then we actually have been looking at the issue of faith and we established from the scriptures that every Christian, if you're born again, you do actually have faith. Uh, faith is not your problem because if you don't have faith, that means you're not born again. Because we saw that in Ephesians chapter 2 that says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And then we know that faith is not the problem of Christians. And we've established by the word that the major problem we do have is the issue of unbelief. And we've looked at this over the past few weeks. We'd actually encourage our viewers to actually look at all the series yeah. we've done. And the past three or four episodes, we've been focusing on the issue of unbelief. And we've established by the scriptures that what nullifies our faith, what actually mitigates against our faith, what makes our faith non-effective is unbelief. And the call of God to us in the place of prayer is not to build up more faith, but to actually push down unbelief that is mitigating against our faith. So I think um, most Christians seem to be more concerned about how do I build up my faith. We are not called to build up our faith uh, because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word. Once you hear God's word, faith comes automatically. But the problem is unbelief. And we've established, if you're just joining us today, that actually there's a type of unbelief that hangs around with faith. Uh, because like people have often thought, they thought either you have faith or, or, or you have unbelief. You can't have both at the same time. Well, I would encourage you, viewers, to actually look at our past three or four episodes where we've actually established by the integrity of the scriptures that actually faith and unbelief can hang around in the same life. And the unbelief can begin to mitigate against the faith. And this is how far we've actually gone. And you see, the very last thing we actually talked about in the last transmission was actually Mark chapter 5 when we looked at the case of Jairus. Uh, you know, Jairus actually had his daughter who was, you know, on the sickbed about to die. And then uh, they simply uh, sent for Jesus. And Jesus said something to uh, Jairus. He said, only believe. And you see, um, what we've been focusing on is if unbelief is that critical, uh, what are the sources? How does it come? I mean, where does unbelief come from? Those are the things we've been looking at. And so far, we've established two main sources of unbelief. We use Matthew chapter 17, Mark chapter 9. And we establish from that that unbelief first comes from what we see. I mean, you see, unbelief comes from what we see, what we perceive in our sense of sight. That's one way. And we looked at scriptures that actually proves that. And we went from there and went to the point of what we listen to, what we hear, that also actually builds up unbelief. Now, the reason why, you might be wondering, why are we looking at all the sources of unbelief? This is the reason. Because Jesus told the disciples in Matthew chapter 17 and in Mark chapter 9, he told them how to deal with this kind of unbelief. He said this kind will not go out except, he told them what it is. But we cannot deal with something that we cannot actually lay hold upon where it actually came from. And that's why we've been looking at the sources of this unbelief that we actually call it unbelief type 2. And the reason we've called it unbelief type 2 
is because it's the unbelief type that hangs around with faith. Uh, and, and that's it. That's how far we've actually gone. And in our last transmission, we have this kind of unbelief. So yeah. even about the origin and the sources. Yeah. So you would do well to fall back on all these episodes. To, you know, we have a lot on the prayer. We have yeah. close to eight or nine. We're turning on prayers now. On prayers, you yeah. You really need to sit down to... Now, if you believe the missing ingredient in the place of prayer is faith, and you want to listen to all these previous episodes, and that's how far we've actually come so far. Now, today, uh, we will actually carry on from that. Okay. Again, we've actually not actually finished investigating the sources of this unbelief. I mean, so far, we've looked at the sense of sight and the sense of hearing. Uh, we're going to look at these other sources. Now, that's what we're actually going to focus on today and see what the Word has to say. But please, uh, I think uh, there's something I actually want us to have a look at in the Scriptures before we actually go into these other sources of unbelief. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the reason we want to look at that is so that viewers can actually see how critical, how significant this issue is that in a place of prayer, our effectiveness hangs on what we actually listen to, on what we're actually talking about today. Mm -hmm. Now, quickly, I want us to look at the book of Luke chapter 17, uh, which is where we're going to kick off from today. Uh, Luke chapter 17. Don't forget, we are still investigating the sources of unbelief, but we are taking a bit of a digression, but we'll come back to the next source of unbelief. If you look at Luke chapter 17, look at verse 5 and see what he has to say there. Okay. If you can read that, Luke 17 verse 5. Verse 5 reads, yeah. And the apostles said unto the Lord, Yeah. Increase our faith. Now, the reason why the apostles said that to Jesus, uh, if you read, actually look from Luke chapter 17 from verse 1, you can get a backdrop of what they said. Jesus was talking about the capacity that they do have in terms of forgiveness. You know, when we talk about things about faith, most people end up thinking we're talking about how to receive from God, how to get a better house, how to get more, how to ask God to give you money, how to ask God to give you um, a spouse, how to ask God to give you a blessing. Most people think we're talking about getting things from God. And if you think so, well, that's just a very, uh, you know, a parochial way of looking at this thing we're talking about. This is a bigger picture. Because even if you want to be able to forgive others, if you want to have the capacity to express the life of God in the place of prayer and beyond the place of prayer, well, this matter is also critical. So this is not limited to just asking and receiving things from God. This is about you being able to exercise the grace of God in every aspect of life. So the reason I've said that is in this Luke chapter 17 from verse 1. Can you read from verse 1, please? Mm -hmm. This has nothing to do with receiving something from God in terms of tangible things. Watch what it says. What does it say there? Then said he unto the disciples, Okay. It is impossible, Okay. but that offenses will come. Okay. But woe unto him, okay. through whom they come. Okay. It were better for him mm. that a mist overhang about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. So we see this discourse of Jesus was about the issue of people, how we respond to offense in our life. Well, I think I'm not too, I'm, I think nobody's immune from this <laughs> in terms of responding to offense. Jesus said it has to come. No, There's come. not, you can't pray offense away. You cannot pray away being offended. Jesus said it will surely come to you. If it has not come to you, just wait for it. It's coming very soon. If you are working in the kingdom, if you are working in kingdom grace and power, offense will come to you. In fact, the Apostle Paul says something. He said, they that must live godly in Christ Jesus must surely suffer what? Persecution. But there was a place he said, but with so much tribulation, we must enter the kingdom. It's going to come. Now, what, look what Jesus said. He said, if you're going to respond correctly, see what's going to happen. What did he say then, please? Three. Look at verse 3. Yeah, go on, please. Take it to yourself. Okay. If thy brother trespass against thee, okay. rebuke him, and if he repent, mm. forgive him. Jesus is simply saying, offense is surely going to come. That's not a problem. But let's talk about how you respond to what is coming. It's, so it means uh, you shouldn't be too much bothered about controlling offense coming to your life. It's how do you respond. respond. See what it says you need to respond. Now, go on, please. Verse 4. Verse 4. It reads. It reads. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day. Okay. And seven times in a day turn again to thee. Okay. Saying, I repent. Mm. Thou shalt forgive so me. So Jesus is simply saying, <laughs> offense will surely come. But let's talk about you making use of the grace of God in your life to respond to what is coming. Now see what it says you need. Now what is the next thing? Verse 5. Verse 5. Now watch it. Luke 17, 5. And the apostle said unto them, Have you noticed Jesus didn't say anything about, you know, the grace of God that is needed for them to exercise this thing? See what the disciples responded to Jesus concerning this particular statement. What did he say next, please? And the apostle said unto the Lord, Okay. Increase our faith. Oh, wait, now, see, can you see that? Jesus said nothing about faith. Jesus made no mention of faith. 
But if you've been with us on this particular transmission the past few series, we've established the fact that faith is not that kind of, you know, something so strange to understand. In the Word of God, faith is you simply responding to the grace of God that you have received. That's why Ephesians 2 says, for by faith, he said, for by grace are ye saved, what? Through faith. God already made everything available by grace. Your faith does not move God. Your faith does not propel God. Your faith does not make God to make something happen in your life. All faith is asking you to do is respond. So what the disciples were saying in this place is, if we are going to respond in such a way to our brother, if he offends us, that means you would need to give us more faith. We need more capacity so that we can respond accurately. So it means all the disciples were saying is, if we are going to respond in every situation in the right way, if somebody offends us and we will have the capacity to respond in the kingdom way, it means we're going to need faith, more faith. In fact, they didn't say they didn't have faith. Can you see? They didn't dispute the fact that they did not have faith. They only said increase our what? Oh, our cool. faith. And that's what we're we'll simply saying. This is what we we'll simply talk about. People know that the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. We talk about these things. And without faith, we cannot even receive from God in the place of prayer. So automatically, our mind begins to think that then I need more faith. If I'm going to exercise more grace. But see what Jesus Christ said to them. Now watch this. The Apostle Peter was asking, increase our faith then. It's your responsibility. If, we're going, if we don't exercise this thing correctly with our brother, if we don't respond accurately to our brother who is offending us, it means you've not given us more faith. And you see, if you are there and you are thinking, well, God has not given us enough faith to do what he's asking us to do. Now see what Jesus said to them. They asked Jesus to impart to them more Faith. Now see what Christ has to say. This is the fulcrum of what we're talking about today. What did Christ say then? Verse 6. Okay. And the Lord said. And the Lord said to them. If he had faith. Okay. As a grain of mustard Oh, seed, amazing. The Lord is saying, well, uh, your problem is not more faith. And that's why we've been talking for the past few episodes. That the problem of a Christian is not more faith. Because if you're a Christian, the Bible says you have the same like precious faith as the apostles. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 3. Apostle Peter said that you have received the same like precious faith as ours. And we talk about Romans chapter 12 that simply says that God has given to every man the measure of faith. Now, if you do English, uh, you do what we call article in English, we have the D and we have the A article. The D article in English is a definite article. The A is indefinite. It didn't say uh, you, we have been given a measure of faith. If it says a measure of faith, means your faith and my faith at new birth will be different. But it says the, God has the measure of faith. It's the measure that you have, that Apostle Paul had, that Apostle Peter had. It's not a faith problem. So there's no point asking for God to increase your faith. That's not a problem. How did I know that? Because in Luke 17, 5, Jesus responded, stop talking about increase our faith. Even if your faith was as a mustard what? seed. He said, you don't need more faith. If it's as a mustard seed, it's going to work. So what's the problem? <laughs> Can you see that? Now, that problem is what we've been talking about, unbelief type 2. The problem is not the size of faith. You might be thinking, you might be wondering, are there not places in the scriptures where Jesus commended somebody who had great faith? Are there not places in the scriptures where Jesus said to that woman in Matthew chapter 15, that woman of Saphronesia, when Jesus Christ said, uh, woman, I have not found such a great faith in what? In Israel. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. You might be wondering, are there not places where Jesus told them, oh, ye of little faith? Now, we're going to come to that very soon. Like I said, we need to talk about these things before we go to the next source of unbelief. What Christ was simply telling the disciples in this place is, instead of you talking about what? Increasing what? Your faith. If your faith was even as a moth that seed, it's going to work. So your problem is not the size of the faith. Your problem is something in you working against even the faith that you actually have. So it simply says here, forget about increase. If it was a mustard seed, it was still going to work anyway. So the problem is not the size. The problem is there's still something there that is actually mitigating against even the one that you actually have. And that's what it's simply saying here. So Christ's response in this place was saying, let's forget about size. Even if it was a mustard seed, it's going to work. Now, so uh, that's one thing to show you why it is so significant and you need to listen to what we are talking about. We are not actually focusing on increase our faith like they pray for. We are focusing on what is that thing that is taking the life out of our faith. And that's what Jesus was going to talk about in this Luke 17, 5. Yeah, what is mind-blowing and surprising for me is to find out in this Luke chapter 17 is that 
that you even need faith for forgiveness. For forgiveness. forgiveness. That's the point. Because we have we have folks in the kingdom who feel <laughs> like anything about faith and belief system turns them off. They get irritated because they have attached <laughs> faith to just receiving, receiving. And so things. because they have chosen to live a minimalist lifestyle so or something think, like well, that, they feel like, I don't need it. Mm -hmm. And they've been talking against <laughs> against faith and they feel like maybe mm. some other people are doing over emphasizing on it and they actually remove themselves okay. from it and they mm. feel they, they can do without faith. Mm. They can do without belief system. So they are mm. fine. They are tone with every other aspect, <laughs> with every other doctrine. But mm. now, if you're going to open your eyes widely to Luke chapter 17, mm. and that from verse 1, you see, even to exercise forgiveness, in which, unfortunately, he was talking about that offense will come. There's nothing you can do about it. Well, you it. can't pray anyway. Even go and hide in the mountain, go and <laughs> shut yourself up, offense will come. It's a matter so of time. So, definitely, offense is coming. Mm. And so, if offense is coming, then you need faith to respond, because even the, the, the disciples just mm. exclaim and say, oh, for this, our response is faith. Mm. Faith, faith. And Jesus is not saying it's not about faith. They, they are talking about, Jesus was correcting the size. <laughs> the size. The, the size. Mm. But uh, he was not debating that like, it isn't faith that you need yeah. to deal with offense. But he's talking about the size. So faith is just it's so important. You can't push it behind. Mm. You can't push it behind. You need it in everything. Even beyond mm. acquisition, you need it to, to exercise forgiveness. Forgiveness even to live. Like, in fact, the Bible says the just shall live by what? Faith. By so faith. we can simply say... If a Christian is not exercising faith, we have to doubt their capacity to live the Christian life. He said, the just shall live by his faith. That's what the Bible says in the book of Hebrews. So what we are simply saying, and what we have actually established so far, is ain't nothing about you saying, Lord, increase and give me more faith. It is all about the fact that if it was just a little faith, it was going to work anyway, as Christ said. Uh, so it means, if it's not working for the disciples, uh, Jesus was actually hinting at something that was being responsible. It's not the size of the faith that's the problem. And now, that's why it's hinting on, mm, on us today. If you are mm, not even paying much attention to what we've been doing for the past three or yeah. four episodes on belief, unbelief, mm, and faith, mm, you really need to pay attention now. You can see that you cannot really push faith aside. Mm, you need faith, even in prayer, just like we already know that one before. Mm, it's even to exercise forgiveness. You that's really it. Faith. You need to pay more attention as we discuss this. As we look at this things. Again, uh, you see, we're going to look at something else quickly. Uh, Matthew chapter 17, please. And we see this. Uh, like I said, what I'm trying to do is just to sensitize you to how critical it is that we understand the sources of unbelief. That's what I'm trying to sensitize you with the scriptures. Look at Matthew chapter 17. And you can see verse 20. Uh, now, the reason, let me give you the background of Matthew 17. And if you've been with us in the past few episodes, you will notice that we've looked at Mark chapter 9 and Matthew 17 of this particular event in history of this man who brought his son to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So if you get the backdrop of this particular um, uh, situation, Matthew 17 is just the point where Jesus actually scolded the disciples for actually not being able to cast out the devil. And Jesus Christ told them it's an unbelief problem. That's what Jesus said. It's not a faith problem. See, Jesus never said anything about you need more faith in Matthew 17. He says an unbelief. They asked him, why couldn't we not cast out the devil? It's unbelief. And when we say this then, it means for you and I, every single time we are incapacitated in the place of prayer. Every single time we could not seem to make a great change by, I mean, by prayer. Every single time mountains are not moving as they should. It means that we have a corporate. We have somebody we can blame. And that person we've come to tell you is this unbelief, this kind of unbelief. Is the one responsible? Uh, and, and we can see Jesus. So this Matthew 17 is a background. Uh, that I'll give you the background of what actually happened. So see what Jesus actually had to say to the uh, disciples in the closet about this, this demon uh, casting out Asia. See what it says in Matthew 17, 20. And see what it says. Now, can you just read... Um, um, verse 19, please, and verse 20. Matthew 17, 19, 20. What does it say, please? Then came the disciples to Jesus apart okay. and said, okay. why could no we cast him Again, out? Again, he said, why could we not cast him out? Now see what Jesus said in verse 20. Now watch this. What is in verse 20? Now what does it say, please? And Jesus said unto them, okay. because of your unbelief. Now he said because of unbelief. Go on, please. For verily I say unto Can you see? You, Can you what Jesus did not say? Oh, you need more faith. He's because because he's, why could we not cast out the devil? Uh, you need more faith. No. He said because of your unbelief. Yeah. That's why. Your faith is not a problem. Your unbelief. That's the problem. Now go on please. For very day I say unto you. Okay. If you have faith. Again. As a grain of mustard seed. Again. We see what is in Luke 17 5 being actually reiterated again in this Matthew chapter 17 verse 20. Jesus, Jesus Christ said to them. It's your unbelief. Now can you see why I did say the other time that Luke 17 5. Christ was hinting at something Luke 17 5. 
when Peter said, when, so when the disciples said, increase our what? Oh. Our faith. Christ said, no, if it was a grain of mustard seed, it was going to work. The problem is not the side, is there's something killing it. There's something destroying it. There's something making it ineffective. So we can see now, this Matthew 17, 20 actually now highlighted it clearly. Because Jesus Christ said, it's because of your unbelief. Then he said, if you add faith as a grain of mustard seed. So he's simply saying, even if your faith was a grain of mustard seed, it would have worked. But your unbelief did the undoing of the faith I'm talking about. Can you see that? Now, this Matthew 17 combined both of them in the same context and said, you couldn't do it because of your unbelief. But even if your faith was a grain of mustard seed. So let's paraphrase what Christ was simply saying. If your faith was as a grain of what? Mustard. And there was no unbelief, it would have been fine. That's what Christ is saying in Matthew 17, 20. It would have been fine. It would have been perfectly fine. But the unbelief is the culprit. So we've actually shown you. Now, if you then get to the place of prayer, Jesus told us in Luke 18, the missing ingredient in the place of prayer is faith. Shall a son of man find faith when it comes on the earth? It's faith. But even now, if you are a child of God, if you're a kingdom kid, if you're a kingdom daughter or a kingdom son, you do have the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, what Christ is saying is there's something that even makes the grain of mustard seed faith not to work. It's a your unbelief. And that's why you would do well to begin to look with us at those very sources of unbelief. We've established two of them. We're going to the third one today. It is very critical. We're not just messing around with time. We are highlighting something that is so significant in the kingdom. If you believe that without faith, it is impossible to please God. So we encourage you to follow us to, uh, to go to the source yeah. of where this unbelief is because we really need to, to expose it. You yeah, know, that's some it. Of them is and, hiding. And, and I that's think why it's there. It's there. Bring the light of God's word into the world. Into it. And so there's something that actually comes to mind. And I think uh, our viewers want to listen to this. And I, I'll talk about uh, this man called Smith Wigglesworth. You see, um, if you've heard about Smith Wigglesworth before, and I believe uh, quite a number of Christians who read Christian books a lot might have heard about Smith Wigglesworth. You see, we often talk about that Wigglesworth was a great man of faith. Because if you, if you read most of his testimonies, the ones he wrote about himself and about his biography and things that people wrote about him, we have lots of testimonies that demonstrated that Wigglesworth was a man who saw great signs and wonders in his ministry. A man of great faith. In fact, in God's generous, he was given the appellation, the man of faith. Now, that's Wiggles word for you. But you know, in reality, if you actually check out, but there was a time he gave a testimony, and I will share that testimony with you. And you, from that testimony, you will find out that Wiggles word, even instead of we saying he was a man of great faith, we would actually have to say he was a man of very less unbelief. And I'll give you this testimony. You see, there was a time they brought a woman uh, uh, to, the, I mean, to, to the crusade that he was actually holding. And as he was actually, uh, he actually wanted to pray for the, for the sick and those who are healed. I mean, those who, who actually were, were under the power of da darkness and the devil. And they brought this woman to Wigglesworth and she actually had a big tumor. And then you see, um, Wigglesworth told them uh, that they should bring her on because she couldn't even stand. And when they brought this woman to Wigglesworth and then two people held her. And then as soon as they actually, uh, Wigglesworth told them, let her go, release the woman. And don't forget I said she couldn't work. Uh, she, he said, release her, let her go. And they said, we're not going to release this woman because she's going to just fall down to the ground because she's unable to walk. And Wigglesworth said, let her go. And as soon as they released the woman, she fell down on the floor and fell on the tumor because she had a tumor, a protruding tumor in her stomach. And when that actually happened, people just went, oh, in the crowd. They just went a bit. There, there was this sense in the crowd where people just fell a bit down and said, we thought it was, a, I mean, that kind of thing. I said, we thought it was a man of God who had authority. And as soon as he fell on the, on, on the tumor, Wigglesworth told them, pick her up again the second time. Pick her up again the second time. And they picked her up again. And he said, let her go. And they said, we can't let her go because she's going to wound herself. We're not even sure if something will happen. And Wigglesworth said, let her go. And they released the woman again. And you thought because the man of God was praying and declaring over the woman that she was going to be healed of that tumor. And immediately she fell down again and fell back on the tumor again. And Wigglesworth said, pick her up again. And they, and they pick her and said, let her go. And they said, no, we'll not let her go. And they said, leave her, let her go. And the third time when they left the woman to let her go, what happened was the tumor just fell out of her body right there on the stage. Now, this was Wigglesworth's own testimony. You can look for the book about his faith. Now, what I noticed then, what does that tell you and I about unbelief? It tells you, definitely then you can conclude the reason why Wigglesworth saw great things in his ministry would not really be because he had a greater faith than you and I. It would be that he had so much less unbelief. A man that refused to respond to what he was seeing in the natural. Just like Christ refused to respond. 
if you were there last episode, we said something. We said Jesus, as he was giving instruction to the devil, Jesus gave an instruction. The boy fell down like he was dead. And Christ said, what? Christ raised him up, picked him up. What we are simply saying is, unbelief is the problem. So Wigglesworth saw great things in his ministry. Not necessarily because he was a man whose faith was higher than yours or mine. But he was a man whose unbelief was so much low that his faith was so effective. And that's what we're talking about. Was it not the same man that we had the account we read of him that at the time when he was asking a lame person to, I think a lame person, an invalid to walk, yeah. the person refused to walk and I said, run. That's the point. Can, the can you do that? The next account was run. The next person <laughs> he gives, somebody that could not even walk. Wigusward was a man of very low unbelief. So now what we are trying to tell the body of Christ today, we don't have a faith problem. We have an unbelief problem. And that's why we are on this transmission, showing us by the word how to kill and how to destroy this unbelief type too. Don't forget, we're not even there yet. Jesus gave a panacea. Jesus gave the way out of this unbelief type too. We're not there yet. We're still looking at the sources, the things that feed this unbelief. That's what we're still looking at. Quickly. And then as we go there, we're going to look at this, um, the next unbelief source. Like I said, we've looked at the sight. We've looked at the hearing. Now let's talk about the next source of how this unbelief actually feeds and grows in us. Let's quickly look at Romans chapter 4. We're going to actually dissect and investigate this unbelief source, uh, this third one. Romans chapter 4, we're going to look from verse 16. We're going to look at the classical case of a man of faith called Abraham. Don't forget the Bible actually says he's our father. For all those who are born of God, it says Abraham's faith is our type of faith. It's called our father in the faith. So we're going to look at this. The third source of unbelief, Romans chapter 4. Uh, can you read from verse 16, please? Don't forget, be us all over the world. We are trying to beam the such light on the source of unbelief. We've actually mentioned two sources. Please listen to our previous episode. This is the third one we're looking at. Romans chapter 4, please, from verse 16. It reads, yes, please. therefore it is of faith okay. that it might be by grace. Okay. To the hand the promise might be sure to all the seed. Amen. Not to that only which is of the law, okay. but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So you want to listen to your father. The Bible says if you're born of the spirit, if you're born of the word, Abraham is your father. The type of faith you have is Abraham's type of faith. In fact, the Bible says here is the father of us all. Now you want to listen to how your father made it. Your father in the spirit. Your father in faith. Now watch this. Uh, let's see what he had to deal with. Now go on please. Verse 17. As it is written. As it is written. Yeah. I have made thee a father of many nations. Okay. Before him whom ye believed. And now see what, what God told Abraham. The Bible said it is written. I have made you a father of many nations. And he said Abraham had to believe what God said. I mean how is that different from you and I today? There's no difference. I mean, today, God will say to you in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that if anybody's in Christ, he's a new creation. That all God tells us now is to tell us what he made us. And the Bible says all we need for life and godliness, he has given to us. The Bible says his divine power has given us all things that has to do with life and godliness through our knowledge of him who has called us to glory and virtue. Now, simply put, uh, God just told Abraham what he made him, just the same way God is telling you what he made you in Christ Jesus. And that's the point. So we were made <laughs> in Christ Jesus. The power, the glory, the, 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 the grace of God is at work in us. So there is no difference in Abraham's experience and our experience. So things that have been settled in Christ, it is finished. God is actually reaching them down uh, for us to read and have faith. So the Bible says concerning Abraham, I've made you the father of many nations. The Bible said in whom he was. He believed. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason I'm actually trying to correlate our faith with Abraham's faith is so you can see the similarity. How does faith come for us? The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, Therefore, faith comes by hearing, mm -hmm. and hearing the word. So Abraham too, God just said, I made you a father of many nations. And he heard what God said. And the Bible said, in whom he believed, he just believed what God said. So it means at this point, we are par with Abraham. You see, we are par with him. Now go on, please. Even God, uh -huh. who quickened the dead, okay. and called those things which be not, as though they were. Well, it's simply, he said the God that spoke to him is the God that quickens the dead, makes the dead to come back to life. Don't forget again, Ephesians chapter 2 tells us and tells you and I, he said, You that you were once what? Dead, dead in, in sins, are they quickened in your sins and trespasses? God also made it to come alive. Uh, so please, again, we are par with Abraham at this point. So there's no difference now. Let's go on, please. 
Which colored those things which be not as though they were? Because, yeah, well, what, you see, that's a very old English. What it's simply saying is God who caused the things that are not obvious as though they were obvious. It means he's not saying those things don't exist. They, are, they exist, but they're not just obvious to the senses. So God speaks to things, to things that are not obvious as though they were obvious. Now, that's what it tells us. And that's the kind of God that Abraham believed in. And you and I know that's the God that we believed in as well. So at this point again, we are par with Abraham. Now, go on, please. Verse 18. Now, what is verse 18? Who against hope? Okay, now, the, now we have things coming in now. Now, who against what? I thought, I, thought, I thought if Abraham believed what God said, that's the end of story. I mean, what are we talking about again? Now, that's the point. So many people think, once I believe God, I believe the word of God, I'll pray in the place of prayer, and then I'll receive what I'm asking God for. Now, the Bible simply says, whatever you ask for in the place of what? Prayer, believing, you shall receive. And people talk about this in the church and say, yeah, I'll believe God in the place of prayer. I'm going to lay hold of what God said and I'll receive. And have you wondered, why is it then that people pray and they claim to have faith and things are not happening in the place of prayer? Here is the answer from the scriptures. Now watch this. Now go on, verse 18. Now it says, apart from the fact that Abraham believed what God said, then he had to do something. Can you see that? <laughs> he said he didn't stop at believe. Look at verse 18. What does he say, please, in Who verse 18? Hope, Who against hope? Believed in hope. Believed in hope, okay. That he might become mm, the father of many nations. So it means, it says, God said to him, I made you a father of what? Many, many nations. nations. But the Bible simply says, Abraham had to do something uh, to make sure that he can become what God said he is. Let's say that again. <laughs> can you see? God said, the Bible said it is written <laughs> in verse 17. I have made you a what? A father of many nations. God spoke the word over the life of Abraham. But the Bible said he had to believe in hope against hope so that he can become what God said he is. Can you see that? Now what we are trying to tell you today is faith does not make God to make something happen in your life. We see, we can say this one million times. Faith does not propel or push God to bless you. Faith only responds to what God said he made you. God made him already. Abraham's belief didn't make God to make him. I think we can slow down and say this again. Abraham's belief did not make God to make him. God in verse 17 already made him on God's side. Already made. Made. Made on God's side. But on his side, his belief was for him to respond to what God said he made him. So it means, and unless he responds correctly, he will not become what God said he made him. So faith is completely on our side and not Never on God's side. Never on God's side. In fact, the Bible says, Shall the unbelief of man make God's faith of no effect? He said, No way, it will not. In fact, in 1 Timothy 2, he tells us, He said, Even if we remain what? Faithless. He remains faithful because he cannot deny his nature. What it simply means is, What God said will never change. In fact, the Bible tells us that the gift and the callings of God are without repentance. Your unbelief or your belief doesn't nullify what God said. So the reason why you have faith is not to make God to bless you, is to respond to what God already did. That's what faith does. So the Bible says here, all Abraham had to do was to what? Believe in hope against hope so that he can become in his experience what God made him in verse 17. Now watch this. Watch what he had to deal with. This is where we are here today. Now go on please. Verse according 18. According to that which was spoken. According to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed say thy seed be. So shall your seed be. This is what God told him again. Now can you see? When God spoke, let's see what Abraham had to do. I would have thought Abraham would have said, I believe, and that's it. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. People say that. People sing the song. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Well, I thought, now watch this. God said it according to that which was spoken. Yes. And Abraham already what? Believe. I think we should have closed the canons of the scripture. I said, Abraham believed. That's it. Abraham believed that's it. it. Now, nah, this didn't settle it. As you will notice, he never settled it. Now, see with the next verse. See the next. What does it say in the next verse? Verse 19. Look at verse 19. Go on, please. And be not weak in faith. Oh, okay. I thought he already believed. What's it about your weakening faith? I thought the Bible said, in whom he what? He believed. God said it. He responded because he believed. In the same way for you, God said it. God spoke over your life. The Bible says, my God shall supply your needs according to what? His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Here are you praising and thanking God for God supplies your needs. But the Bible says, even Abraham believed in what God said. But verse 19 says, you know what? <laughs> he refused for his faith to become weak. Now let's see what's going to weaken a man's faith. What is this thing that is weakening Abraham's word? That wants to weaken Abraham's what? 
faith. Be faith and believe. He said, no, Abraham already had faith. <laughs> Abraham already believed, but he also made sure that his faith was not weakened. Weakened. By who? Who is this person trying to weaken Abraham's faith? Who is this thing that is trying to actually weaken the faith of Abraham? Now watch this. What does it say next? And being not weak in faith, okay. he considered not his own. Ah, not now we know this is the culprit. There is something that is about to weaken the faith he had in verse 17 and verse 18. Now, this is why we are on this transmission. If you think this transmission is about just talking and actually wasting about with time, it's not. We are talking about the fact that belief and faith can actually coexist with something that can weaken the faith. Abraham already believed in verse 17, verse 18, but he said there is something that Abraham refused to weaken his faith. He said he did not consider, consider his own body now dead. Now, this comes the third source. Of this man called unbelief type 2. Now watch this. If you want to know why, what the name is. Now read before we come back to this verse. Um, uh, 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 verse 20. Now what does it say in verse 19? Sorry. When he was about an hundred years old. Go on please. Neither yet to the deadness of Sarah's womb. Okay. Verse 20. Uh -huh. We staggered not. Okay. At the promise of God through unbelief. Aha. That's him. We found him. We found him. So at, it means that even though he already believed in verse 17 and verse 18. There was something that had the propensity to grow in him. There was something that had the propensity to grow in his experience. And the Bible calls that thing in verse 20, unbelief. unbelief. It means even though he had faith, even though he believed, the Bible says there was something also that had the capacity to grow alongside his faith. faith. That's the point. That's what we are talking about today. So now we know the reason. Why Abraham was able to have Isaac, his son. <laughs> now we know the reason that Abraham didn't just have faith in God. Abraham also had to deal with unbelief type 2. The one that grows in the same place as faith. Now, we, now hiding right there in verse 19 is this explicit word that says, How did this unbelief, what was the channel that the unbelief was using to what? Was trying to use to come in into Abraham's life. It tells us he did not consider his body. Now that it means Abraham, the way he was feeling in his body. Now I will tell you this: there was nothing that actually indicates. If you go to Genesis 12, 13, 14, 15, those five or four or five chapters, there's nothing that told us that Abraham wasn't feeling like a hundred-year-old man. He surely was feeling like he was hundred. That's what the Bible says. Even though he was feeling like he was what hundred, God was telling him something that a man who is not hundred should actually be able to manifest. For example. If Abraham was 30, if he was 30 years old, if he was 40 years old, if he was 50 years old, now this would not be a miracle because, I mean, people would normally think that a man of 30, 40, 50 years old should be able to give back normally. I mean, unless the man has some medical problems. But the reason why it's a miracle in giving back to Isaac was the age of Abraham. So the Bible says, even though he was feeling like he was 100 in his body, he was feeling like a 100-year-old man, but Abraham refused to be able to focus or sit down and meditate and think and reason about the feeling in his body. And that's Bible says he was able not to stagger because of what? Mm -hmm. Unbelief. So we now know how this unbelief was going to come. He was going to come in through the way he was feeling in his body. And that's the point. So we see another thought source of unbelief. How you feel within yourself, in your body. How does your body feel like? And again, he goes on and says the deadness of what? Sarah's womb. He refused also to consider that. If you check some other translations, they will tell you he refused to even focus on it. And I think we should check other translations about this. Because we are trying to highlight the third source of unbelief. For example, for example, if God says to you in 1 Peter 2.24, he says, Who in himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that's Jesus, so that we've been dead to sins, we should live unto righteousness. He said, by his stripes, he didn't say you will be healed, he said you were healed. He said, as Christ was beaten with stripes, that guaranteed your word, yeah. healing. Of course, you believe God. And you lay hold upon the word and say, Father, I believe that by the stripes of Jesus, I wasn't going to be healed. By the stripes of Jesus, I don't need to pray long enough to convince God to heal me. By the stripes of Jesus, I was already healed. Thank God you have faith. You take hold of your healing. I say, thank God for that. But what happens? As soon as you finish praying, what happens when you feel in your body that the symptoms were as crazy as they were before you began pray, before you began to pray, or if you feel in your body that the symptoms are even worse than I mean, worse than when you began to pray? Now, what do you do? 
do you sit down and say, well, uh, let me check. Let me check on the internet. What, does, what happens when, when, when they say, when, th when, when you begin to feel this way? Oh, it means it's getting worse. The Bible said Abraham, even though he felt like 100, <laughs> even though Sarah's womb actually felt like she was 90, the Bible says he refused to consider that. And why did he refuse? The Bible said because he didn't want unbelief to grow. That's why he refused. That's why the Bible said in verse 20, he said he refused to stagger through unbelief. So we see how unbelief actually comes in. If case. our viewers will just look closely at verse 19, it was saying, mm. and be no weak in faith. Mm. It's actually giving a lane, a credence to that evidence that faith and unbelief can coexist. And, and unbelief can weaken. <laughs> because you can't be talking of something weakening if there's nothing extra, something is there. You can't talk something mm. weaken something. Mm -hmm. That means there must be another component that is actually Sapping pressing something out. So mm. if there's nothing present, nobody talks about mm. it's either present or absent. So whether faith is there or not. Mm. But when we not say something mm. weakened, so that shows that there's something mm. that can sit on the head of faith. In, and and, and sap the energy out of it. Yes, and crush mm. the faith. So mm. it's telling that you can have faith and mm. give you another credence to it, that you can have faith and not believe there. And one can be strengthened and one can be weakened. You know, can, it depends on which one do you want to strengthen. Which the, one do you feed? Feeds. That's the point. Which one do you want to draw life out of? Now, mm. so you are just like it is your choice to make which one will be you have to choose out of the two which mm -hmm. one you are going to make strong. Mm. So, I, I, Abraham made the choice mm. to feed that faith, and that faith was strong. He has already he feeding it with the word of God, whatever it takes for him, he made sure that his faith at every point in time was strong, mm. and so the unbelief was weak. Mm. And then, so, he was not weak in faith, and this is our choice. I, I see there's something I want our viewers to actually listen to on this, you know, like we said in our last transmission. Abraham did not just say, well, I'm going to feed my faith, mm -hmm. and that's it. I'm going to feed my faith, that's it. Everybody I'm going to... will want to say that. But Abraham didn't just feed his faith, he also did not consider. Now, this is where the rubber hits the road. That we simply said, most people focus on, I'm going to listen to God's word to build my faith. That's good. But you still have to also have not to consider. That's the point. The Bible said he did not. Because he did not consider his own body now what? Dead. He also actively chose not to. This is where the whole point is, that people talk about building faith, but not much is spoken about how do you kill unbelief. So we see Abraham doing both. He listened to what was said and he believed. And also he decided consciously not to consider his own body now dead. And we see, well, let's see what some other translations have to say about this very action of Abraham. So and let's before see. Before you go there, yes, I please. just want to say that uh, the way you're talking about the other part of, of the of working on the unbelief part and exactly. which Abraham did not neglect yeah. because he chose not to consider. Mm. And that's how we're encouraging you to the way to do about it is just stabbing. You know, when you feed your mm. faith, you stab the unbelief, you stab mm. the doubt. Mm. And the way to stab it is taking its life, taking its nutrients, consideration, mm. analyzing. That's you know, it. The, yes, that is how to feed that's the food. Mm. You know, when you begin to analyze it, you are working your head over it mm. and you are beginning to look at it and consider. Mm. So by the time you take away the nutrients, you mm. stab it. And say, no, you, you have nothing to consider here. We are not looking at it, any, any report here. We are not analyzing mm. this report here. Mm. There's nothing for you to look at. Then you've already taken the food mm. off your doubt. Mm. You're mm. taking the food off your unbelief. And that is when you have stabbed it. And when there's no food, there's no nutrients. Mm. It doesn't have something to work on. Then mm. it's go with. Mm. So you're not just going to focus and build your faith. You're going to stab. Mm. Simultaneously stab and choose not to <laughs> consider. Because mm. it's a choice. He could have just left his faith like that and grow his faith and say, yes, grow his faith. I'm hearing more of God's word. I'm mm. just listening to what he has said about what he called me and try. I'm just reading it. I'm mm. putting it in my case. I'm hearing it. I'm driving. And mm. so, but consideration, he chose to simultaneously mm. not to consider, mm. to stop the doubt. So we must do both together. Now, well, I think uh, viewers, uh, if you want to join us, I mean, on our next transmission, we'll be looking at the way out that Christ gave on how to deal with this unbelief type. So we see from what you said uh, that it then becomes counterproductive if as a Christian, you feed your faith and you feed your yeah, unbelief. Yeah, yeah. That is an exercise in futility, which is what most people do. Uh, we do things that actually feed faith. We, we listen to the word. We go to church. We actually meditate on the scriptures. But simultaneously, we do things that actually feeds the unbelief, and the unbelief grows alongside the faith. So here we see Abraham feeding his faith by listening to what God said, according to what is written in verse 17. And in verse 19, according to that which was spoken, he was doing that. But at the same time, he also chose not to consider the source 
of unbelief. So we see him simultaneously executing both. And that's what we actually are lighting today on this knockout scene. I believe the Lord, like we are <laughs> functioning more than the capacity of Bestra, <laughs> as we are giving out, dishing out this word, that they have mm. the, we have the sense, mm. the, the, our viewers have the sense to work on this. Because mm. now, they really have to balance this out. <laughs> as they are feeding their faith, they are not feeding their doubts, and not believe at the same time. Yes. So today, we release that, the scriptural sense for you, to mm. be able to understand this and mm. resolve Mm. This is what is mitigating about your faith and affecting your effectiveness in mm. place of prayer. And, and you see, uh, before, I mean, I'm not sure if we have more time uh, on this, uh, today's transmission. And let me say this. I was thinking you want to go to tell us the other uh, versions of how yeah, they, yeah, they exactly. that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about that. And um, before we actually get to the other verses, I mean, other part of the, I mean, other translations uh, regarding Romans chapter 4, verse, uh, you know, 19 and 20, we need to say this. That this unbelief growth is not necessarily uh, just about the fact that uh, what you listen to on TV, what you hear, or newspapers, or what people say in the society. It might be amazing for you to understand the fact that right in the place of worship, you can listen to things, you can see things, you can feel things that actually can actually grow your unbelief and mitigate against your faith. So now, look at what um, some other translations actually oh, have to say. Sorry, I'm stop cutting you off again. In that yeah, that's side. fine. You know, talking about you can even the place of worship, you can yeah. have both grow at the same time. You can uh, yeah, grow at the same time. Like uh, <laughs> most of the time, in most of places of worship, and which I've known some, and some people have even actually talked about this. You see, place in place of testimony, where people thought it would be for edification, where the place of faith is generally. Mm -hmm. But now, if care is not taken, we find that, that if some people, the way they give testimony, mm -hmm. they can go on and on and on and on about how the devil is walking and this and this, exactly. and give the dramatic, they won't even spare any details. And so the people <laughs> are on the edge, and people are beginning to understand the workings of how the demons work and everything, all in the name. To, and then when they come to the end of it to say they just talk about the victory like maybe one sentence and everything like that but they, mm. they, they actually took their time mm. to give the dramatization but nobody mm. goes and give that corroborate evidence about how the redemption works how mm. the power of God came to be and everything mm. so then the, in, the, in the process of people listening to something mm. like testimony for edification of faith mm. but they are just swelling fear <laughs> you know, that kind of people don't get any fear. They even go more doubting and more in the workings of the powers of the demons. People get to get scared. Mm. Not in the place of... Uh, the That's place in the place of, of worship. You even hear the things that actually builds up on unbelief in the place of worship. And so we see prayer points again that jails up about where they can go on and on and dramatize. Mm. And give you pictures and people begin to have mental images. Mm. Of the workings of the enemies, but they don't have the mental images of the workings of the spirit. Mm. They don't have the mental images. Nobody's bringing into their view, into their focus, how the redemption, how, how, how it disgraced the power. The book of Colossians, yes, he said, he, he stripped them naked. You know, it's a, how he demolished, how he embarrassed. So nobody's bringing that into the vivid images. It's not building them, building it up. In, mm. the, in the sight of the people, in the mental images of what they go into dramatization. In the place of prayer. In the place of prayer, in the place of watching, in the place of testimony, and dramatize the work of the enemies, and go on and on about it, and they just, in a way, stylishly talk about. Mm. So they are, they, are, they, are, they are giving more energy, feeding more the unbelief. Feeding the unbelief, and yeah, feeding starving, less the faith. You know, starving and feeding less of the faith. So you really have to work this out yourself, and this is your responsibility. Abraham took it upon himself. He had a choice. Mm. He has he has the report to look at. He has the body to look at. He has the body. He's 100 years old. He felt 100. He felt, <laughs> he 100. felt like he was 100. And he could see Sarah. He could see the, the state that Sarah was. Mm. So he had all this, but he chose. It's mm. your choice. So mm. it's your choice to what you are going to Listen to like we we did the previous episode. What you are going to look at, what you are going to listen to the last and episode, and today what you are going to feel, feel what like, you are going to that's consider. The How do you feel? What do you? I mean, what what mm, we what you mm, choose to analyze mm, now? What are you going to give your thoughts to? Mm, what are you going mm, to consider? So it is you, even in the place of wherever you are. So you don't feel free and feel relaxed, even in mm, most places of worship. Mm, and you see somebody is feeding your doubt. Somebody is coming in conversation. Supposedly, a man or a woman, a man or woman of God, who is actually talking of it and is in a stylishly or in a way openly, and well. is still feeding on belief, <laughs> you need to make a choice mm. on what to consider. Mm. Whose report you will believe. Thank you for that. And you see, uh, we, let's say this, <laughs> which is again the point we are making is it's not enough to feed faith. You have to consciously starve unbelief. Yes. You cannot feed both and expect great results in the place of prayer. It's not going to work. It's going to cancel. It's going to weaken the faith. That's what the Bible is saying. So Abraham successfully 
executed God's promise over his life, <laughs> not just because he believed, but because he also fought unbelief, according to Romans 4, 17 to 21. Now see what the message translation has to yes. say about what Abraham did about unbelief. Now that's what, that's what we're focusing on today. See what it says in Romans chapter 4, verse 19 to 25. It said, Abraham, I'm reading the message translation, Romans chapter 4, 19 to 25, message translation. Abraham didn't focus on his own impotence. <laughs> Can you see that? Okay. Abraham didn't now, the message translation used the word focus instead of the word consider not that KJV used. It says, it means about focus. Can you see? He refused to focus on his impotence. So it means Abraham wasn't just believing what God said. He also wasn't focusing on impotence. Now for some people, if they were Abraham, this is what they would have done. In our current generation, some Christians will believe what God said, and at the same time, they will take time out to focus on the impotence. Uh, they will take time out to investigate the impotence. They will take time out to know every single bit of detail of why they have said in the statistics that um, if 25% or 75% or 99% of people that have this kind of impotence, medical science has said they don't actually make it through. And all these things, we are so knowledgeable in our generation that it's doing our faith a lot of damage. The Bible simply says Abraham didn't focus on his own impotence. Can you see? And it says it is hopeless. I repeat, Abraham didn't focus on his own impotence saying it is hopeless. Can you see that? This 100-year body... Uh, could never father a child. <laughs> can you see that? Abraham didn't focus on that. To say this 100 years old body can never father a child. He refused to focus on that. Nor did he carry out a survey. I'm reading message. He was survey. He didn't do a I survey. Think, I think you should read this now. Now, Abraham didn't focus on his own impotence. I'm reading Romans 4, 19 to 25. Message translation. Abraham didn't focus on his own impotence and say it is hopeless. This 100 year body can never father a child. Neither did he survey Sarah's decades of infertility and give up. Uh, he didn't tiptoe around God's promise asking courteously skeptical uh, questions. Question. So there we see, he didn't do a survey. You know, for some of you carry a questionnaire. Can you see that? Questionnaire, they'll tell you, well, you know what? This particular thing that is happening in your family, this particular thing that is happening on your job, this particular thing that is happening in your situation and circumstance, you need to do a survey. If you check online statistics, only 1% of people make it through. And we, we feed and focus on these things. And yet we go to Bible study and prayer and try to feed our faith. And what we are trying to do is do the impossible. Feed our faith and feed our unbelief. And we wonder why our faith is so weak. And that's what Abraham refused to do. He responded to God in faith and he consciously fought his unbelief. So we see one of the sources of unbelief. In fact, you might want to say, according to this message translation, from survey and questionnaire and statistics and data. I mean, see, that's the point, and that's what he tells us. There. Yes, I think you should go. He didn't tiptoe. Yes, I think you should go. He said he didn't tiptoe around God's promise, asking consciously skeptical questions. Mm -hmm. He plunged into the promise and came up strong, ready for God, sure that God will make good on what he had said. And that's what he tells us about what Abraham did. So, we've established one thing today. It's not enough to build up faith. It is also enough not to build up unbelief simultaneously. It's an exercise in futility if we do that. I just hope our viewers will be able to know how to deal with reports and how to deal with all this analysis. <laughs> so how to deal with, because you like, okay, message was talking about survey. Some people ask questions around. So they ask, has it ever happened in your family? Has it ever happened from where you stay? Has mm. it ever happened for people of your color? Mm. Those are the way of asking questions around. You don't really need to go and bring the paper <laughs> and do a desktop research like that, mm. as message put it. But asking around, or people feeding you information around, it has never happened. Did you see anybody in this year with these your conditions and with these your metrics doing this mm. despite it? So those are asking around. People can ask for you around mm. and you can physically be asking around simultaneously where you had the word of God. But what is again surprising here is like it's not actually the report of Abraham was able to the strength. I'm looking at the strength of Abraham's faith because mm. he was able to deal with his own body. You know, as in, he was not able to focus on the deadness of his own body and see that he's, he has aged mm -hmm. as dramatically to be able to father the child. The impotency, they was able to even handle the deadness of Abraham's, uh, Sarah's, Sarah's womb. womb again. You know, that is a, that's a very <laughs> strong faith. A strong faith that is actually can settle yours, can, can, can nullify unbelief and doubt in you, and can address. And nullify unbelief <laughs> in somebody else. 
That mm. is the no wonder it's the father of faith. Mm. So we are calling you to a greater faith. It's a greater responsibility. I think, I think, I, think, I mean, before you go on, sorry for cutting you in the midst of what you're saying. May we say this then, uh, that we can give Abraham a new title. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Abraham was a man of great faith. Or let's say Abraham, a man of very little what? Unbelief. That we can say that. A man of very low unbelief. Very low dose of unbelief. That's what he has. So we're we calling that. you to that responsibility <laughs> of strengthening <laughs> your faith and weakening your doubt and unbelief and be able to do it and mm. do it for your household be able to do it for others so you can stand in gap and mm. able to not consider the reports for others too after you have mm. done what we are talking about today is like to bring you to that position mm. be able to be able to your faith will be able to strengthen others you know <laughs> you and have help to others to deal with their, with their unbelief, unbelief as well so mm. you need to be strong and be strong for others and be strong for your community so let your faith grow Mm. That is, are you, are you, are you know the way to let your faith grow is by weakening your own belief mm. so that your faith will have strength and be able to consider the reports. You can undo reports, completing mm. reports. So you can undo reports for the nation, all the mm. database and research, or completing and negative reports. And you can say, reports. I refuse to consider that. Yes, that's why the world is growing inside of you. <laughs> you choose not. You can go and do it and you can undo for others too mm. as well. So we just hope that this transmission, has, if it has blessed you, we want you to sit back, pause back, and listen again and mm. think about all these things. You know, we are talking about feeding faith and starving doubt. Mm. You really need to give give it time. Mm. It takes time for all these things to to be processed. It takes time for our body to realign. To to be forcing your situations to realign. Say by force, you must listen to this and you must come in in a path. Mm. At least you must line up with God's word. So if mm. you really have to take your time on it and you have to be insistent like this, you don't have to walk it to. I tiptoed around God's promises cautiously. Mm -hmm. Will it happen? Will it not Asking happen? Asking skeptical questions. All around. Let me see. Let me let me combine. Let me mm -hmm. see what people are doing. How can we meet both ways? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it doesn't happen that way. So mm -hmm. you really need to be insistent and say, no, I'm mm -hmm. not giving up, just like Abraham, and sit with it. So you might need to do this again. Find mm -hmm. a way of doing it, whether it's downloading and download it so you can listen to it again and invite others mm. to do that because you really want others you want their faith to be built mm. you want your sarah to like it sarah to receive strength mm. so you really need to get the strength and the other people around you to have that strength mm. for faith you know to make your life easy so you need people around you so you need to share this with your contact mm. and so next week saturday uh, will be coming 7 p.m mm. again and you mm. want to have an announcement and let's say this uh which is very important. Uh, we've not even begun to talk about the way out of this unbelief. Mm -hmm. Jesus gave us the way out. He gave the disciples the way out. And you want to actually join us on our next transmission tomorrow morning uh, at actually 9 a.m. UK time and 10 a.m. Nigerian time. We're going to be looking at what Jesus actually stated as the way out of this unbelief. And also, uh, if you are in the greater Manchester region or the Lancashire region, uh, we'll be, by God's grace, we're ministering tomorrow morning at Chapel House Christian Fellowship at 11 a.m. So if you're in the Greater Manchester region or Lancashire region, please join us as we minister in that church. And if you're not able to join us, uh, you can actually join us uh, live, um, uh, you know, by Facebook Live Transmission. We'll be live as well at that time. And we hope to meet you there. So we'll be expecting you tomorrow, 9 a.m. UK time here for Exposé to continue with analyze the sources. Now, so to continue to see the way out. Because what's the there's way no out? point of <laughs> just knowing the source and you don't know how to get out. Yeah, of it. exactly. So you really need to come. If you'll be following us, you need to come tomorrow and mm. to listen to this mm. and find time to listen. You take the, even if you've gone to service, you can listen to it at a later time. And you can join us on a live transmission again for the for the administration we'll be having at Charlie. Mm. Gospel Center tomorrow. Center, yeah. So to, to see you tomorrow, we want to say you to go and work on your own belief, work on it. Mm. You have to stop your doubts. Mm. See you tomorrow. We say bye. bye.